This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about integral elements. So let's first define these. Um, so suppose S is an R algebra. So an element S in S is called integral over the ring R if um, it satisfies a polynomial with leading coefficient one. So we have S to the N plus R N minus one, S to the N minus one, plus R naught equals naught for R I in R. Um, so for example, let's try and find the integral elements of the rationals. So let's take R to be Z and S to be the rationals. And let's find the integral elements of um, the rationals. So suppose we've got an element S, which is um, A over B with A and B integers. Then, then we know that A over B to the N plus R N minus one, A over B to the N minus one and so on, plus R naught equals naught where the R I are integers. Um, and we can assume that A and B are co-prime, obviously. So now we multiply this by B to the N and we find A to the N plus R N minus one, A to the N minus one B and so on um, equals zero. Um, and um, now we see that if P divides B for some prime, So then P divides all this because this is all divisible by B. So um, then P divides A. Well, A and B were co-prime. So, so B is a unit. So um, A over B must be an integer. So the integral elements of the rational numbers are just the integers, which is just as well because the um, otherwise, the term integral would be a bit weird. Um, notice that all we've used here is that Z is a unique factorization domain and Q is its um, field of quotients. So if we have any unique factorization domain as R and its field of quotients as S, then, then the integral elements of R in, in S are sorry, the integral elements of S over R are just the elements of R. Um, so um, let, let, let's look at some basic properties of integral elements. First of all, if S is integral, this implies that R of S is a finite, is finite, um, and what this means is finite as um, an R module. So you remember when you talk about things being finite, you can mean finitely generated as an algebra or finitely generated as a module or finitely generated as a field, and these are all different. And, and here we, 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 we mean, when we talk about a, a ring extension being finite, we usually mean finite as as a module, the terminology just is a bit confusing. Um, and this is obvious because it's generated as a module by one S, S squared up to S to the N minus one, where S to the N is equal to um, R N minus one, S to the N minus one and so on plus R zero. So you can see from this that all higher powers are also in this module. Of course, it's finite as an algebra, it's just generated by the element S, but as a module, you need more generators, but you still have only a finite number. Um, and the converse is actually also true. So if R of S is finite, then S is integral. In, in fact, we can prove something slightly stronger. If S is um, finite over R as a module, um, then all elements 
of S are integral. Um, and um, I'm going to give two proofs of this. The, the, the first is if R is notarian, it has a very easy proof. We just look at the submodule of S generated by one and the submodule generated by one on S and the submodule generated by one S and S squared. And this is an increasing sequence of R modules. So eventually two of them must be equal. So one S up to S to the N minus one must be equal to the module generated by one up to S to the N. But this says that S to the N must be in the module generated by all the things up to S to the N minus one. So S to the N is equal to R naught plus R one S plus R N minus one to the N S to the N minus one. So if R is notarian, this is very easy to prove. And normally if something has a proof like this over notarian rings, it's generally not true over non-notarian rings. But in this case, um, this is an unusual exception in, in, in that in spite of this easy proof for notarian rings are, it's still true for um, non-notarian rings. And to do this, we're going to use the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. Well, you may have come across the Cayley-Hamilton theorem in linear algebra. And people who do the Cayley-Hamilton theorem for linear algebra are wimps because they just work over vector spaces. And we're going to do the Cayley-Hamilton theorem over, over for modules over arbitrary rings. So what does it say? It says that any automorphism, sorry, any, doesn't have to be an automorphism, it can be an endomorphism, phi of a finitely generated R module M is integral. Fairly obvious, should be fairly obvious what that means. It just means phi satisfies uh, a polynomial equation with leading coefficient one as, as, a, as an endomorphism of the R module. And we, um, to prove this, we suppose um, M is generated by elements M1 up to Mn. So th th these do not necessarily form a basis. In fact, M might not have a basis. It might not even be a free module. And these might not be linearly independent. Um, and then phi is given by some n by n matrix. And you've got to be a bit careful here because this matrix is actually not uniquely determined by m1 up to mn because these might be linearly independent. So there might be several different matrices um, corresponding to phi. So this matrix is not unique. So if we were working over a field and took this to be a basis, then, then there would be a unique matrix for phi, but, but for, for rings, we have to be a little bit more flexible. And this means that if we take this matrix here with just phi down the diagonal and subtract um, this matrix A and apply this to the vector M1 up to Mn, this is just equal to zero. I mean, that's more or less what you mean by saying that phi is given by some matrix. So, so on this side, um, it, so, so this thing here is a matrix and the coefficients are in R of phi, not just in R. And now we know that if we've got any matrix and the matrix times it's a joint, which is some weird matrix you probably forgotten from linear algebra formed by lots of n minus one by n minus one minus is equal to um, the determinant of the matrix times the matrix with just ones down the diagonal. Um, so in particular, um, if we take the determinant of this matrix, 
both phi's down here and then subtract a, this um, acts as zero on the vector m1 up to mn. So as zero on the matrix M because it kills off a set of generators. Um, in other words, um, this determinant is a z it just acts as zero on M. And you notice this determinant is a polynomial in phi with coefficients in R and leading coefficient one because we've got a, a term phi to the n from the determinant down the diagonal. So um, phi is a root of the um, integral polynomial where you just take the determinant of this matrix x, 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 and so on, and subtract the matrix A. So phi is integral. We can even write down the explicit polynomial it satisfies if we really want to. So um, from this, we, we, we can go back to the theorem we are trying to show that um, if, remember, we were trying to show if S is finite as a module over R, all elements of S are integral. And what we do is we just take the module M to be S. And if little s is in S, we take the element phi to be the endomorphism given by multiplication by this, this element S, which is an R linear map from S to S. And then if we apply the theorem, we see that um, the element S is integral over, over R because the polynomial satisfied by this transformation phi will obviously also be satisfied by S. Um, so um, we see from this that S is finite over a ring R is equivalent to saying that um, S is generated as an algebra by a finite number of integral elements. So let's just check this. Well, this implication we've just done because all elements of S are integral. So you can just take a finite set of generators of S as a module, and these will obviously generate as an algebra, and they will all be integral. So that's easy. The other implication is also fairly obvious. That the, 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 all you need to do is to show that if, um, if we've got two um, finite subalgebras of S, so let's call them S1, S2, then um, they generate a finite subalgebra. Finite as usual means finitely generated as modules. And that's very easy because if S1 is generated by elements A1 up to AM as a module, and S2 by elements B1 up to Bn as a module, then S1 and S2 are both contained in the module generated by the elements A, I, B, J. And this is obviously also a finite module, and it's also obviously closed under multiplication and addition, so it's a ring. So any integral element will generate a finite algebra. So a finite number of integral elements will also generate a finite, finite algebra. So, so, the, uh, so this implication follows. Um, um, the fact that um, two 
in, in, in particular, if we've got two integral elements, then their sum and product is also integral. So for example, in number theory, we can take z equals the, sorry, r equals the integers and s equals all, um, let's just say, well, let's, let's just take it to be the complex numbers. Then the integral elements um, of C over Z are the algebraic integers. And uh, these form a ring because we've just shown if you've got two algebraic integers, they both generate a finite extension of Z and you can take the, 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 the ring generated by both of those and that will also be a finite extension of Z. Notice that this is um, not really obvious if you just use the definition of being roots of a polynomial. For example, suppose you've got the square root of two and you add the cube root of two and you add the fifth root of two. And let's find a polynomial um, in z of x with this as a root. Well, I'm not going to do that because, in fact, the smallest polynomial like this is degree 30. And there's no way I'm going to write out a degree 30 polynomial. So you see, if, if you think of these as being roots of polynomials, it's not at all obvious that adding two roots of a of um, polynomials is going to be a root of another polynomial, but it is sort of obvious if you if you think of integral elements as being things generating finite extensions. Um, so, um, um, so next we're going to um, uh, look at the concept of normalization. So, um, if um, um, S is um, the integral closure of R in the field of quotients, S is called normalization Of R. So this is yet another example of the word normal being grossly overused by mathematicians. Um, the interval closure is, of course, just all elements integral over the ring R. Um, so let's see some examples of this. For example, Um, let's let's find the normalization of z with root five adjoined to it. So the field of quotients is just q root five, which are the numbers of the form. Um, a plus b root 5 for a and b um, rational numbers. So um, let, let's find some elements of the normalization. Well, it obviously contains all numbers of the form m plus n root 5 for m n integers. And it's not at all obvious what else it could possibly contain. In fact, um, the obvious guess is that these are all of them. But in fact, it does contain some other elements. Let's try and find the normalization systematically. Um, if m plus root 5n is in the normalization, let's call this normalization s, then pretty obviously m minus root 5n is also in s. And we've seen that um, the, the, the normalization is a ring, so if we add these, we find 2m is in s. Um, now, 
uh, sorry, that shouldn't be S, that should be in Z. No, uh, should be in S. So 2M is in S. So in Z, because we've seen that any rational number that's um, integral over Z must actually be Z. So M is either an integer or it's a half integer. Well, the ones with M and integer we've pretty much found. Um, I mean, you can easily check that if M is an integer, then M must also be an integer. So this leaves over the possibility that M might be a half. Um, and in fact, there is a number with M equals a half that's integral because we can take one plus root five over two. And this is the notorious golden ratio phi. And you can check that phi squared is equal to phi plus one. So it is integral over, over the integers. Um, and this shows that the normalization of z root five um, is not z root five, as you might guess, but z one plus root five over two. Um, the same thing happens for z of root d, for d congruent to one mod four, you find that you can get things of the form one plus root d over two, um, which um, is, is a root of um, x squared um, plus x minus d minus 1 over 4. And I've got a sign wrong here. I can never remember what the sign there is. Uh, let me put it plus or minus. Um, um, so uh, I think I, I don't usually give exercise in lecture, but let me let me give a quick exercise here. Find the normalization of z root d for d an integer. And you may as well assume it's square free. Otherwise, you can just take out the square factor without really changing the normalization. Um, so, um, Um, next, one other thing we should check is that the integral closure of the integral closure is just equal to the integral closure. Um, for example, suppose you've got um, um, a root of, say, x cubed plus alpha x plus the fifth root of 2 equals 0 where alpha cubed plus alpha plus one equals zero. Then this implies x is also an algebraic integer, um, which again is not immediately obvious if you try and find a polynomial with integer coefficients satisfied by s. And this follows from the fact that if s1 up to sn are integral over, over r and s to the n plus s n minus one, n minus one, um, s to the n minus one, and so on, plus s naught, s naught equals naught, then, then s is integral over r. And this follows fairly easily because you notice that you've got r contained in r s one, opt, sorry, s naught up to s n minus one and this is contained in r s naught up to s n minus one s and this extension here is finite as i'm meaning that's a finite r module as usual and this extension here is finite and you can easily check if you've got a composition of two finite extensions like this then this extension is also finite so little s is integral because it's in a finite extension. Um,
And uh, uh, fi finally, we, we just mentioned that, that the ring R is called normal if um, it is integrally closed in the field of quotients. I guess if I'm taking a field of quotients, I should make R an integral domain. Um, so for example, any, um, if R is a unique factorization domain, R is normal. Um, actually, we proved that at the beginning of the lecture. We sort of showed that the integers is integrally closed in the rationals and commented that the same proof works for any unique factorization domain. And we've also seen that something like z of root 5 is not normal because its integral closure is z1 plus root 5 over 2. Um, so um, what we're going to do next lecture is study the geometric meaning of um, being integral or being normal, because it turns out that being normal is a sort of very mild form of things being non-singular. It turns out that if you've got a variety and its coordinate ring is normal, um, that doesn't mean it's non-singular, but it means that all singularities have co-dimension um, at least two.